Hi, guys. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm introducing my father. I think I can pronounce the last name properly. It's Breiner. It's <laughs> Dr. Mark Breiner. And um, my father and I have a clinic together here in Connecticut. Um, and I kind of grew up with listening. You know, the reason I do everything I do is because of him. So uh, everything from the idea of holistic dentistry. And I guess everything you do is because of me, too. Because when I was younger and I was sick with chronic ear infections, that sent him on this trek to homeopathy. And, wow. and he, he's always learning, and, and, and one thing led to the next, and here we are. We have this clinic together with integrated dentistry and holistic medicine and uh, energy medicine and, of course, the EEG I've been doing since we started opening it. And so we've been uh, uh, kind of pushing the envelope, and uh, I'm not going to give too much more of an introduction. I can let my father speak about uh, what we're talking about tonight, which I think is just so important for – you know, every time we we think we're looking at EEGs, we're giving a different reasons why we could see certain things, high power, low power, uh, you know, uh, patterns of toxicity. Uh, and my father's one of the leaders in the holistic dental field. He's written a book called Whole Body Dentistry. I suggest everyone get that for your clinics. Get make sure your patients read it. It gives you a lot of great information. Um, so there's so much. You could probably lecture from now till. Uh, next year on various topics, but um, I'm letting him uh, take one topic I think that'd be really interesting for everyone tonight. And here you go. Go ahead, Dad. Good evening. Um, yeah, tonight I want to essentially present some material uh, that can actually save possibly your life or a family member's life or somebody you know, a patient, a uh, friend. So, what I want to do is make you into a dental detective. Try to see why. There it goes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you know, you only see what you know. I know I'm still learning. There are things that I have seen, and I never knew what I didn't know. <laughs> so I'm still uh, continuing to uh, learn. And when I have something new presented, I'll see things that I been looking at for a long time and all of a sudden I'm going to see it in a totally different light. Um, it's very important to really look and observe. We want to, you know, we all tend to, and I'm included in this, you know, we, we get hung up on with what we're doing and if we have a hammer, everything's a nail. So it's very important that we broaden our scope and remember there's more out there. Like even so with patients, when I shake a patient's hand right away, one of the things I want to know is I'm looking, is their skin rough? Uh, is there, are their hands cold? Maybe there's a thyroid problem. So it's very important to observe your patients. Here, you know, we have somebody you can see uh, the posture, his head, his ears are forward of the shoulders. Um, here's a, a boy, you can see one shoulder is higher than the other. And uh, this one here, um, hmm? where are we? <clears throat> but anyway, right, you can see on the on the right the um, how one shoulder is very high. The head is off to the side. This person, one hand is higher than the other. It's just uh, all torqued. And then. <laughs> Let's see. All right. And here, look, as, as her head goes back, you can see how it doesn't track back straight. So all of these are important. We want, we get a very thorough history. Um, I'm not going to go much, but it's part of the history that these are things that you all can do. You can all look into your client's mouths. When you look at this and you see those gray fillings, those are mercury, half mercury. The other half is copper, tin, zinc, silver. That mercury is coming out 24-7. That's a whole lecture in itself. I just want you to be aware because mercury is mercury. According to the American Dental Association, the only safe place in the entire universe to store mercury is in somebody's mouth. I mean, if you take out one of those molar fillings, put it into a five-acre lake, you wouldn't be allowed to eat the fish out of there. So you may think they're small, but there's actually a lot of mercury 
the average four foot fluorescent light that you're not supposed to throw in the garbage has about 12 milligrams of mercury. One of those molars has about 750 milligrams of mercury. So, and it's not innocuous and causes a lot of problems and does cause, you know, I know a lot of you here are into, uh, you know, the neurobiofeedback and all, well, mercury affects the brain. And you've heard the, from Alice in Wonderland, Matt is a hatter. Well, that was because in Danbury, they used to take the hats and they would polish the felt with mercury and they'd go mad as a hatter. And also, um, yeah, there, there's an electrical component because when you put dissimilar metals into a salt solution, you create a battery. So I've seen patients that their brain has been affected by the metals in the mouth. Matter of fact, in my book, I talk about uh, the wife of this physician and she traveled all over the world and with her job. Uh, and what happens is she would periodically, the world would invert on her and down she would go. And she'd been in all the top hospitals in, in London and in Italy and Paris, I mean, all over. And her husband uh, is affiliated with Yale and nobody could figure out what it was. But when I took a voltmeter and tested, she had mercury fillings in her mouth and she had gold. And going from one of the gold fillings to the mercury fillings, I think that was like 950 millivolts. And talking to a neurobiologist, what would happen, because there was no current, they said, well, when that would discharge, probably flip their brain. So these are not innocuous. The other thing you can question patients about, you won't see these only on an x-ray, is do they have root canals? Because root canals are also something that can cause a lot of systemic effects. And again, a lot of electrical, because a lot of times what will happen inside this root canal, uh, and what you see here are the roots of the teeth. And that won't show up. So, <clears throat> and that white filling material goes inside the root where you have your nerve, your blood supply, your lymph supply. And it's thought that that tooth's fine. All right, took the nerve out, it's dead, doesn't cause any pain. All right, let's not worry about it. But the problem is, is that is a chronic low-grade infection. And it's all a matter of can your immune system quarantine the toxins? Uh, again, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on that, but um, because that's, again, another whole lecture in itself. But a lot of times with these, they're going to go and put a stainless steel post down into the tooth to reinforce the root. They're going to build it up with the mercury filling and they'll put a crown, nickel-based crown or even gold-based crown can, from an electrical standpoint, generate a lot of um, electrical current. The other thing is periodontal disease. You know, if your gums are bleeding, when you floss or when you brush, that's something that you all want to be aware of because that can, there's a lot of research out connecting periodontal disease with all sorts of diseases because inflammation now, you know, everybody looks at that as a root of many, many uh, autoimmune diseases and disease in general. And when you have periodontal disease, you're having a lot of inflammation. And these are the things you have to investigate. We use a microscope. We take a plaque sample from under the gum. We look at it and see uh, good bacteria there or there are parasites there. Again, that's a whole other thing. But this is something you can look into your own mouth, family member's mouth. Do they look red? Do they ask them if they bleed? Because if they do, you definitely want to uh, address that. The other thing that's very interesting is every tooth is on an acupuncture meridian and relates to certain organs and tissues. And so it's very, uh, when you see a root canal, and if you have, if you know somebody or have patients or clients that, let's say have uh, breast cancer or a history of breast cancer, find out if they have a root canal on that same side. I mean, if you, uh, an oncologist I know, and somebody from Switzerland who has a big health clinic will find way over 90% of the time a root canal on the same side as the uh, breast cancer. So 
again, that's that's all. But today, the focus I want of this lecture is on the temporomandibular joint. Now, this joint is the most used joint in the uh, entire body. I don't know if I point to it, then I can't advance it, right? So, um, but <coughs> where you see it says condylar process, that's the condyle, that's the head of the, the lower jaw. And it sits into a depression in your temporal bone, and there's a disc in there. And this is critical because I can't stress enough, when this temporomandibular joint is not in harmony, it creates tremendous amount of problems. Okay, so one of the things you all can do right now, take your pinkies and take the pad of your pinky forward towards your nose and put it inside your ear very gently, pressing slightly forward and open and close. And see how many of you have a, a click or a rustling sound in there, okay? If you have that, that's a warning. And uh, for me, it's, it's a stop sign, uh, it's a red light, we need to look further. The other thing you can do is you can actually just take your finger and palpate all around that, right over that head of that condyle, behind the condyle with the mouth slightly open or forward of that. You don't press hard, and if that's tender, that's also a warning sign. <coughs> And what I want to do is I want to show you a normal joint. Where is it? So it's, it's hard, I can't point to it. How can I? Okay, so what happens is, okay, where that cursor is now, that's a disc, that's cartilage that's in there to help this go and run smoothly. This is a synovial joint, you have synovial fluid in there. The head of the condyle should be moving very smoothly. To the far left is your ear canal, okay? And that bone on top is the articular eminence of that temporal bone. And that's how a normal joint should function. And what happens, I'm going to show you where the click comes from, if any of you are having a click. If I put this, this will do Let me go. Okay. <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't use a pointer. But this is a normal joint. And when you have that, you're not going to have that click in there. It's going to operate very smoothly. All right, let me go to the next one. I have my IT guy here. Now we got to go to the next one. That's the normal joint. Okay, now I want to show you what happens if that condyle is forced back in that joint. The disc is displaced. Now, see, click. See how you get that? It's not smooth. Watch as it comes forward, click. Click. So that's where that click is coming from, is because that cartilage, that meniscus, that disc in there has been displaced because the jaw has been forced backward. And we're going to talk more about that as we go on. Okay. One of the things that I do to co confirm this, which is something you all can do. I got to the next one. Um, is applied kinesiology test for TMJ. Um, can you play that? 
So here, So we're going to do is we're first going to check this muscle here. I like to use you can use any muscle. Well, I like the leg muscles because they're good and strong. Good and strong. Now take the two index fingers from right in front of your ear on that joint, bite down, and then resist. And if there's a problem, you're weak. Okay, then we're going to do this. I made a bite to push our jaws into the proper relationship. Down there. Put your fingers in front of your ears and resist. And then I can't budge her. So uh, you won't be doing uh, so a bite, but nevertheless, you could check to see if there's a temporal mandible or a joint problem. Now, could you all hear that? Yes. Okay, so you can do that on each other. You can do it on your family member to find out indeed if there's a, a problem in that joint. So now the things we know we have a temporary individual joint problem, what are some of the symptoms of that? This can have profound effect, okay? You can have facial pain, jaw aches, back aches, headaches, vertigo, all these different things can be caused by this. And as you can see, when we're testing that muscle, it has a profound effect on the autonomic nervous system. So these are things, if you're, especially if you're suffering from chronic headaches and back aches and neck aches, this is something you want to look into. Um, it, that lower jaw does not sit in space. So when that jaw, especially if it's forced back or it's not in proper position, you know, you have under your chin all these muscles that go to your hyoid bone under there. When those muscles are, when your jaw's not in proper position, those muscles are all reacting. And guess what? Those muscles attach right to your um, C2 vertebra, C3 vertebrae. So you're causing a tremendous problem with your cervical area. You know, this is somebody who had three years of head pain, been to all sorts of neurologists, um, pain medication wasn't working, and he was just getting totally frustrated. And what we did is uh, essentially I put his jaw into a proper position, made an appliance. So we just gave Tom his uh, DNA appliance, and uh, how's that feel? A lot better. Had facial pain coming in. Just having this in for a couple of minutes, I feel it relieving like immediately. Very good. How long have you been seeing people for this neurologist for this pain? Three years. Going on three years. No help. No help. So, <laughs> <laughs> and the next one. So, <laughs> and he's been now out of pain. We're in the middle of treatment for last four months and he has not had uh, any pain. So naturally he's very happy. But what caused the problem? What, 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 how do you end up with a TMJ problem? How does anybody end up with that? Well, usually it's gonna start as a child. So those of you who have children or have grandchildren, you know, these are some of the things you wanna look at and uh, warn them if, you know, if you see a lot of kids that are, can't breathe through their nose. When you can't breathe through your nose, you're not going to have proper facial development. They're going to be mouth breathers. Uh, if they're bottle feeding, they weren't um, breastfed. If they're finger suckers, tongue tie is a real problem. We'll see, you'll see why. And of course, nutrition enters into it and heredity. And uh, unfortunately, as kids get orthodontics done, very often it's not done properly. So all these things, the tongue tie, the, um, all these things, not uh, breastfeeding, all things we just listed leads to the upper jawbone not developing properly. And that maxilla, okay, affects, if you see here, the yellow is the maxilla. And that affects all these things on the left.
Now, when I was in school, the orange bone there, I was taught was the keystone bone. That's the uh, sphenoid bone because that touches all the other skull bones. But I really feel it's the maxilla, which touches the sphenoid because when that does not develop properly or it's not in proper position, the sphenoid's affected and consequently affecting everything. Again, when this TMJ is off, your whole structural balance is off. You have to have your head in proper position in three dimensions, anterior, posterior, left to right, and up and down. When it's not, everything is thrown off. And it's amazing how fast you can result in a change for somebody by just putting it into a proper position. Okay. I've been suffering from vertigo and dizziness for many, many years. And I have also- you said for over 30 uh, years. I've been able to go up and down escalators. I've always had to hold on to, hold on for dear life when I've been mounting stairs and I was realigned today, and for the first time, I was able to go up and down the stairs without holding on and without vertigo. That's nice. So it was amazing. She had vertigo all these years. She couldn't fly anymore, and it was all because her jaw relationship was off. And all I did is put her into a proper jaw relationship. I put some putty material in there and told her to go walk up and down the stairs. It was that fast that she could see a difference. So an underdeveloped maxilla, all right, when you don't have that developed properly, you're gonna have narrow arches and you're gonna have crowding. So this is one of the things. I wanna give you now things that you should be looking for. What are, what are warning signs? So when you have a child and you see this, you can't see their lower front teeth, they have this deep overbite, well, that's something that you better say needs to be addressed. Here you see a lot of crowding. You have that kind of crowding. The arches are too narrow and it needs to be addressed. It needs to be addressed by a dentist or an orthodontist that is going to uh, know how to expand these jaws properly. Here's tongue tied. This is the ligament that takes your tongue and tethers it to the floor of the mouth. When that is too taut and you do not have good uh, freedom for your tongue, it can't get to the roof of your mouth. The tongue is a fantastic orthodontic instrument and should be resting up on the roof of your mouth. When it doesn't do that, it doesn't develop properly. When you see if uh, somebody has buck teeth, well, what you want to do is address that. And unfortunately, what a lot of orthodontists do is if somebody has, quote, buck teeth, is guess what? they move the teeth back, and that's absolutely the wrong treatment. What it is is the lower jaw has to come forward. If you go back, you're jamming that condyle. You want to look at a profile. You can see how that chin is back from the, from the upper. Here's one really stands out. This child's going to have trouble. You can see how her lips are apart. It's a mouth breather. So besides TMJ problems, all right, not counting mercury, root canals, what can have a profound effect on one's health is one's airway. And this is really critical. It's a very, some of it's very undiagnosed. People aren't aware of it. And unfortunately, uh, most practitioners aren't aware of it. Remember I talked about mouth breathing. Well, when you breathe through the mouth, your nose your nose is blocked, you can't breathe properly, you tend to breathe through the mouth. That leads to guess what? You're not filtering through your nose where you have your, your villi, you have nitric oxide to kill uh, viruses and bacteria. You end up breathing through your mouth, you end up then with enlarged tonsils, and you're not getting, you're blocking your airway, you're not getting enough oxygen. I want to show you, and some of us have seen this. <clears throat> Listen to this child. Go 
It's not working. It's not working. Okay, what happens is in this video, the child, you can hear the child, you know, breathing like that. They're struggling for air. They're not getting enough air in. And when the mouth is open, a child has a, uh, an airway normally of about seven millimeters, uh, the narrowest part. And when you, they open, they close down that airway. And you could be down to one millimeter, two millimeters. So they're not getting proper air in. They're struggling for air. So you have two problems. You have a temporal mandibular joint problem, maybe a restricted airway, but it's almost 100% of the time that with a restricted airway you have a TMJ problem. That's why it's so critical to be aware of these TMJ problems because that's a clue that either a child or an adult will have an airway problem. Now, I want to talk a little more. We were finding out, the research is finding out with these kids when they are suffering from the sleep uh, breathing disorders, that they have all these symptoms related to it. And by correcting the jaw problems, expanding the jaws, letting them get enough oxygen in, they're finding there's a huge decrease in ADD. Bedwetting, kids that are bedwetting say they're eight, nine years old, in a matter of very, very short time, start expanding those jaws, letting the lower jaw come forward, the bedwetting stops. All these things with nightmares, irritability, so many of these things. I know a lot of these things, you know, will be helped with neurobiofeedback too. But when you see these kids and having these, you might want to question the parents. Do they hear them breathing at night? Breathing should be very quiet. You shouldn't be able to hear somebody breathe. Ask if the kids are restless sleepers. Do they wake up sometimes on the floor even or are their covers all off of them? Do they ever go into the room and listen to them? Do they stop breathing? And if it's not addressed as a child, it's usually not going to self-correct. So here's the airway. You see the upper airways. You go in through the nasal cavity. You come down, and then you come down to the, the lower airway. Now, I want you to notice the tongue. People don't realize how big that tongue is. So when you see, again, this crowding, you see these narrow arches that that tongue looks too big for the mouth. A friend of mine calls it a six-foot tiger in a three-foot cage. When you see that, alarm bells should go off. You should think, is there a problem here with, an, with the airway? It's like putting a, your foot, and that, that tongue is going into a space there's no room for it. Now, I, I wish I could point to this, all right, but on the left, you'll see uh, a normal airway, how open it is. Here. It's, it's wide. As you come in, you see through the nose. This is a sagittal view as though I section the head right down from top to bottom right in the middle between the eyes. And then if you look to the right where I circled in red, you can see how narrow that is. And everything you see in front of that, you see most of that is the tongue. The tongue is huge. And what's happened is that tongue is being forced back into that airway. All right. And then one of the things we do on a, a 3D scan is we can actually measure the volume. So on, the one on the left is the previous one you saw. There's a total volume of 21.3 cc's, and a min in the minimum area, you see it's 361. Now look at the one on the right. The total volume is much less. You need about 20 cc's to be comfortable as a minimum, and that minimum area should be up, you know, around 275, 300. So this person is struggling. They're, uh, they're at risk that probably if, we, if they have a sleep study, they're going to be diagnosed with obstructive uh, sleep apnea. And that sets you up for all sorts of problems. So one of the things you want to uh, find out, how many of you snore? How many of your spouses or companions snore? How many of the kids 
snore. This is something you ought to ask all your patients because that's one of the cardinal signs that there can be a problem. And the other one is do you wake up refreshed? You know, I had a, a, a 29 year old in today and I said, uh, he was in for a hygiene visit. I said, do you wake up refreshed? And he says, no, I'm not waking up refreshed. We did a CT scan on him. His, his volume of air, total volume was seven cc's. He had an airway that was uh, three millimeters. He is struggling. And it's like I say, this is something that is undiagnosed. There were uh, train crashes uh, we had here in New Jersey and New York about a year ago. And what they found was these train engineers had undiagnosed sleep disorders. They fell asleep at the controls. And that was the whole cause of the, the train wreck. So the sleep disorder breathing, okay, you have obstructive sleep apnea is one form. That's all the way at the other end. And when you have this, you're much more risk for high blood pressure, stroke, heart attack, all these things, diabetes, obesity, uh, cancer. You can turn any cancer cell, uh, any cell cancerous by decreasing the amount of oxygen. It compromises blood pressure, cognitive problems, okay, particularly those risks for Alzheimer's. So you have these people you're seeing for neurobiofeedback. Find out, do they wake up refreshed? Do they snore? Do they ever wake up startled in the middle of the night? Are they ever gasping for air? <clears throat> and look at this with children. You harm the brain cells. I mean, you actually you lose neurons when you don't uh, get proper sleep. Here's one for all us guys, all right, erectile dysfunction. You need oxygen you're going to have less REM sleep. This is what a lot of you are dealing with, all with the brain. And this has profound effect on the brain. So what clues are there in the adult? Some is the same thing. You have a narrow arch. Now, I don't know how many, I, unfortunately I can't point, but you see the two molars. In front of that, there's one tooth that by custody comes to the eye tooth. Well, there should be another tooth in there. There should be, behind the eye tooth, there should be four teeth, and if you have wisdom teeth, five teeth. What happened was this person, the orthodontist, because they had buck teeth, took out four permanent teeth and moved everything back. And now they're stuck with uh, sleep apnea. A good sign is look at your tongue. Do you have tooth imprints on that tongue? That's telling you there's not enough room. That tongue is trapped. If you look in somebody's mouth and you can't see the uvula, it means you're at much higher risk for sleep breathing disorder problems and severe apnea. Here you have, if you find your, like especially your lower teeth are wearing, see how you see on the tips of those teeth, the darkness, that's worn through the enamel. There's recession there, the darkness towards where the gum is, that's recession, that's the roots being exposed. That's because these teeth are banging up against the front teeth because that lower jaw is trapped. It wants to break out of there. You know, do, do you hear your partner grind their teeth? It's called bruxing. That's that lower jaw. Is, it's trapped. It wants to get out. It needs room. And a lot of times because of that, you're going to go and have what's called that fraction where you have this recession and where your teeth are... If you take your fingernail, you'll feel notching. A lot of dentists say, oh, that's from toothbrushing, but no. Most of the time, it's not. And when you have that, you have to uh, suspect tooth grinding. And again, the tooth grinders have all these symptoms, which are all similar to what somebody suffering from sleep disorder breathing has. You know, I have patients, uh, like I had one today, we're talking about uh, their sleep problems. I said, how many of those symptoms do you have? Oh, I have six of them. Well, that's a problem. And one of the things to look for are people's heads forward. You know, if you're going to do CPR on somebody, one of the things you want to do is you're taking their lower jaw, you're putting their head forward and back, right, Adam? 
Adam was a big top CPR person. Because you, as you do that, you're opening the airway and people are struggling to get air in. So their head is forward, tilted up, like on the far right, it's extreme. They get a hump back in their neck and it's all because they're trying to get air in. If you have, if you look in your mouth and the lower front teeth are higher than the back teeth, that's usually a sign that there's a problem. Again, tongue tie. It's very important in, in the adults, uh, if you're going to have treatment, we have patients go and that can be uh, with a laser that's released so they have total movement and they'll have to have some myofunctional therapy to retrain the tongue and get it to learn to go to the roof of the mouth. And if a kid has it, you definitely want to uh, take care of that. Sometimes you'll see the teeth are worn. If you come edge to edge in the front, they fit together like a jigsaw puzzle because they're out there grinding at night saying, let my lower jaw come forward. Give me freedom. Give me, let me get air back there. See, why does somebody have a lot of crowns? If some of you are noticing, you know, you're going, your teeth are constantly breaking. Well, try to get to the root problem, which is usually going to be your bite is off and you have a TMJ problem. Again, look at the profile. Look at his chin is too close to his nose. His chin is way back. There's no upper lip. All these things. When you have, you look at your nose. See how the openings are uneven? That tells me because, again, because all the muscles are being strained, that is causing strain in the cervical area, and it's also causing strain on all your sutures in your cranium. You got a deep overbite. Look at those lower teeth. You see between those two front teeth, those lower teeth are almost touching the gum up there. And do you find you clench your teeth? If you clench your teeth, there's usually a reason. And again, there's evidence that jaw clenching and sleep bruxing are all related to um, <clears throat> sleep breathing problems. Some of you may find out you have these large bony masses in your mouth. That's usually a reaction to clenching because your, your, your bone is, you know, it's like a muscle. If you keep contracting your biceps, it builds up. Well, here along the, uh, the bone, the bone actually will flex and it starts to build up. And you need your sleep. And uh, so ask your patients. Your clients are they are they sleeping? Look at that. If you people have problems with sleep or increased risk for developing emotional disorders, depression, and anxiety. And people with sleep problems, not getting enough oxygen, are not getting into a good sleep. They're waking up constantly. You need sleep to repair. So one thing I want to tell you, things that can be done, you can have uh, if you have Physician will uh, tell you have a CPAP machine where you're driving oxygen into the airway, or you can move the tongue out of the airway, and that can be done with either an appliance, which um, is like this, where it goes over your upper and lower teeth, and there's a bar, and it will pull your lower jaw forward and pull that tongue forward. Not the most comfortable thing. Um, and it only helps while you're sleeping, when you're wearing this, but it can save somebody's life. The CPAP can also, but CPAP compliance with that oxygen mask over your face, driving oxygen in there, is about a 20% compliance. And it's a killer uh, for your sex life. <laughs> so the other thing you can do that I do is orthopedically move and widen the jaws, where we use uh, appliances, We've, we run a study, we find out where should that upper jaw be, how much is it deficient in, um, in development, and then we figure out how much do we need to develop it. We do this with removable appliances, and then that will then allow the lower jaw to come forward. This is the kind of appliances we use, and uh, this is kind of before and after. That person on the left who had sleep breathing problems, with the narrow arches, and on the right, you can see how they've been made nice and wide. And it's interesting, as you widen those arches, 
the vault of the roof of the mouth comes down and very often people with chronic sinus problems will then, they'll clear up. And you can see the difference in the profile. So we don't need to give you a quiz. Um, so essentially that, you know, these are things that I think are important for you to, to be aware of, to look at, look at yourselves, your spouse, your children, your grandchildren, friends. I ask you, please be aware because this is so undiagnosed and you can literally save somebody's life. Uh, I have a cardiologist friend of mine, we did a scan on him and uh, his airway was one and a half millimeters. I mean, he was like, quick, we got to do something. And he knew he had sleep problems, but he didn't realize how terrible it was. And his volume was, was nil. And as a cardiologist, he said, yeah, we got to work fast. He said, I know I'm at increased risk for a heart attack, sudden death. So if anybody has any questions, be happy to field them.